So let's talk about some more molecular homologies. Here's an example from cytochrome C. Now you may say, well, cytochrome C sounds very familiar. Yes, it does. Uh, because cytochrome C is a protein that is uh, highly important in cellular respiration. Now, um, obviously, it's a protein, so all proteins are made of chains of amino acids. And because cellular respiration is such an important process for all organisms, um, remember that's how we make our ATP, or energy currency, it's what we call highly conserved meaning you don't see many changes um, in the DNA code or the amino acids that code for that protein because if you had too many changes, you would change cellular respiration. You wouldn't be able to get the energy your body needs. So we see almost identical uh, DNA sequences and amino acid sequences for cytochrome C across all sorts of species, whether you're talking about mammals or chickens or fish or wheat or yeast, it's all the same, uh, very similar codes and amino acid sequences for that protein. So uh, for example, uh, this is the DNA sequence uh, for a certain subunit of this protein. So here's a human and here's a plant. And you can see the bases, thymine, guanine, you know, here's cytosine, adenine. Notice they're almost identical, except once in a while you'll have a base mutation. Like uh, this human got a, a guanine, a G, whereas plant got a cytosine. So one change there. But looking over it, it's so similar. And that's a plant and a human. If you look at the actual amino acid sequence, uh, here's the humans, glycine, asparagine, valine, glutamate, et cetera. If you look at those 20 amino acids you studied before. And everywhere where there's a dash, that means it was exactly the same amino acid at that location in, in these different species. So pig, chicken, dogfish, drosophila, wheat, yeast, all exactly the same, glycine right there, um, et cetera. And you look here, okay, here's, we had isoleucine, we got valine in the pig and the chicken, et cetera. So their lineage stayed with valine. Cysteine, same all the way across. Cysteine, same all the way across. Very interesting, huh? Who'd have thought that a yeast and a human are so similar for proteins that are so important that they can't be changed too much because you'd get a different result. So that's evidence um, for macroevolution, the fact that some proteins are so highly conserved at the molecular level. That's called a molecular homology. Um, so these things were homologous from some kind of aerobic ancestor that evolved about 2 million years ago. So less than a third of the amino acids for cytochrome C have changed in 2 billion years. That's crazy. And if you look at very closely related species like the human and the rhesus monkey, our cytochrome C amino acid sequence only differs by a single amino acid out of many, many different amino acids that make up that protein. And um, if I move me out of the way again, here's, a, here's the cytochrome C protein right there. So how cool is that? And you're like, okay, well, what amino acid difference between a monkey like a rhesus and we humans, that's not that hard to see, but check out yeast versus humans only differ by 44 amino acids out of the many, many amino acids that make this protein up. So again, evidence for macroevolution. And uh, between humans and chimps, no differences at all. So why is this? Well, go back to the genetic code. Um, you'll remember that the code is degenerate, meaning that you can get a single base mutation in some cases and still get the same amino acids. So for example, if our uh, codon was CUU -U, and there was a base mutation and you got CUC, you still code for the same amount, amino acid leucine. So if um, this doesn't make sense, uh, go back to some of uh, my YouTube lectures um, from um, the first semester of biology where we talk about um, protein synthesis and the genetic code. So. Anyway, because of this highly um, redu this redundancy in the genetic code, you can have um, base changes and still get the same amino acids, allowing that protein to be highly conserved over evolutionary time. So let's look at some other um, evidence for speciation, for macroevolution. Well, we've actually observed new species being produced in the laboratory within a human lifetime. Yes, it's actually happened. So um, these are just a few examples. Um, if you look in the scientific literature, there's many examples of this. Um, here's one example. This is a primrose. 
And uh, if you um, look in the literature, there's been cases where this primrose of the species, um, so for example, this was documented way back in 1905, um, you can see that uh, as they raised these guys in the laboratory and they had them in different areas and were separated from each other, some uh, individuals of one population actually ended up changing their diploid number of chromosomes. So the normal uh, diploid number was 14. In this mutant variety, it was 28. And as a result of that happening where there was a duplication in chromosome number um, of this other population they had in the lab, those two were no longer able to breed together, um, so they couldn't hybridize and produce viable offspring. So that happened within a human lifetime, that suddenly a duplication in number of chromosomes in this guy, and suddenly you have two species. They can't breed together, whereas we know they originally were the same species because they were collected by humans from the same area and were breeding together. They were the same population, and then you separate them in the lab, and lo and behold, they can't breed anymore. So under the BSC, the biological species concept, these guys are now considered separate species. Um, and so they actually named this other species. Um, so instead of Onethera lamarckiana, it's now Onethera gigas. Um, we also saw this in fruit flies in the lab. So here's a species of fruit fly. Uh, this was by Dobzhansky, which we already talked about, and uh, Pavlovsky in 1971. Um, so for these guys, they had a single pregnant female that they captured out in the field in Colombia. Uh, they let her have her babies. They started raising these babies and breeding them. And so before 1958, you could take uh, these different cages, individuals from different cages that originated from this one mother, and they could hybridize and make a new, um, you know, make several strains from this. They did this kind of breeding in each of these cages and kept them separate for several years. And so by 1963, um, when you hybridized individuals from these two cages, they would only produce sterile males. So those males couldn't have babies. Um, and so um, initially, you know, there was nothing keeping these guys from breeding behaviorally. Um, but after a while, these guys started undergoing assorted of mating, where they preferred to mate with um, individuals from their own cage instead of individuals from the other cage. So um, they started doing assorted of mating. And so eventually these guys are separate species because they could not produce fertile males together. So, so many things we can do now um, with molecular evidence, with biotechnology. And man, if Darwin knew about this, I mean, he'd just be giddy because he didn't even know about DNA. <laughs> you know, it hadn't been discovered for a long time after he lived. Yet he was smart enough to kind of pick up on how change over time could happen. But uh, for example, let's take DNA, DNA hybridization. Um, now we're able to actually take DNA and sequence it and get the actual um, base sequence. And that, that's really easy to do actually these days. Uh, we can make um, billions of copies of a particular gene using a technique called PCR um, and go and uh, run um, what are called electrophoresis gels to actually see differences in, in um, allele sequences among different individuals. That's called um, fingerprinting. We can do it with DNA. We could also do protein fingerprinting. Uh, so let's talk real quick about DNA, DNA hybridization. This is really cool. This is where you can take DNA from two different species, say one from this individual and one from this individual, and they can be very different species. But because of the ability of these DNA bases to pair up, remember A with T, C with G, you can make hybrid DNA, you know, where one strand is from one species and another strand is from an individual of another species. So it's quite easy to do. You can easily do it in the laboratory. You basically, um, you know, take one individual's DNA, you heat it up and add some enzymes and it separates it. Take another individual's and separate it. So now you have two separated strands from each species. And then you can take one strand from one, one strand from the other, and whoop, they will wind back up and make a hybrid DNA. And everywhere where those bases are matching up, you know, A to T, C to G, they'll form a nice bond that will be difficult to break apart easily. Um, but if there's a mutation, say a C with an A, okay, those don't hybridize, they don't, um, they don't pair up. And so it kind of makes like a little weak loop and it's easy to separate that. So you can actually um, measure the difficulty of re-breaking that hybrid DNA up and use that as a measure of evolutionary relatedness. The closer related evolutionarily these species are, the harder it is 
to break apart that hybridized DNA because more of those bases will have matched up. So, um, for example, uh, this is how they figured out that giant pandas are actually more similar related, closer related to um, red pandas than they are to bears. So you can see that um, by doing DNA-DNA hybridization, here's your giant panda, and they figured out that he diverged from the common ancestor about 15 to 20 years, uh, million years ago. So here's your raccoon, and here's your red panda. So the giant pandas are closer related to raccoons and red pandas than they are to actual bears. So here's a sloth bear, sun bear, black bear, polar bear, brown bear. Um, so that was 2 million years ago. So you know the divergence was much closer to the raccoon than to the bear. So giant pandas are actually kind of variations on a raccoon as opposed to variations on bears. So DNA, DNA hybridization and other molecular evidence, molecular um, homologies and comparative embryology, more sources of evidence for macroevolution speciation.